Hey everyone, welcome to Hormonally Speaking. So happy that you're here with us in 2023. We have just had one episode, one or two episodes so far. And so I'm excited to dive back in with guests and sharing all kinds of good new knowledge around your hormones and your health in 2023. So happy that you're here with us. Today, I am speaking with Brooke Ansley, who is a certified hypnotherapist and creator of Happy Body Blueprint, a course that teaches women how to build a fit body with hypnosis so they can ditch the diet cycle for good. She combines her passion for the mind-body connection with a bachelor's degree in psychology, a 200-hour yoga instructor certification, and a unique skill set as a former applied behavioral analysis therapist. Brooke aims to help women heal their negative inner self-talk so that they can free up headspace for more motivation, happiness, and healthier choices. It's her goal to empower women to reconnect with their bodies and create long-term sustainable health. You can find out more at her website, brookeansleywellness.com, or on Instagram at brookeansleywellness. Welcome, Brooke. Thank you. Yes. I'm excited to be here. So I'm, I was pumped to get you here on the podcast because I don't think, I mean, I've talked in passing with some guests about hypnotherapy, but we haven't had this deep discussion. And I think it's something that, as we were talking about before we got on here, a lot of people have um, ideas about what hypnotherapy is that are not necessarily true and they don't necessarily understand how it can help them, not just with their mental health, but with their hormone health. Yeah. So yeah. what a lot of people don't realize is that hypnosis is actually a natural state that we all move into every single day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just alpha theta brainwave state. Mm -hmm. And it happens as it actually happens. It can happen if you've ever been like really entranced in a good book, or right. if you're watching a movie and you feel like you're part of the movie, we call it entranced because you're in a trance oh, essentially. Okay. So it's a state of, re of um, focused relaxation. Mm -hmm. It also, we move through alpha theta brainwave state in the morning. So when we're in a deep sleep, we're in Delta and we come up through theta and then alpha before we're fully alert and awake focused, we're in beta brainwave state. Gotcha. And when you're in that, I like to call it jacuzzi for the brain, <laughs> <I like it. laughs> which is really fun um, yeah. imagery. Um, so when you're in that state, the critical part of the mind is relaxed. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that you're unconscious and you don't know what you're doing and someone can make you do something you don't want to do. It just simply means that left side of the brain, that voice that's telling you who you are, where you've mm -hmm. been, all of those limiting beliefs that have been conditioned since we were a child, mm -hmm. that voice becomes more relaxed and it mm -hmm. gives us access to the subconscious to create change using the whole mind mm -hmm. without allowing that voice to kind of say, uh-uh, like, I know who you are. I know where you've been. I know what your beliefs are. And, yeah. and that that's kind of like a filter on our behavior and our perception. Yeah. And yeah. so we can use that state of alpha theta to get into that state of very focused relaxation. It's meditation essentially is a state of hypnosis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The big difference between meditation and hypnosis is in hypnotherapy is that hypnotherapy is meditation with a goal. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. use eye fascinations and imagery to to, to walk the, the mind into that relaxed state. So you get into that state quicker and easier. Cause I yeah. know yeah. a lot of people are like, well, yeah, okay. Tell me to meditate. It sounds great, but yeah, in theory, <laughs> I'd actually yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right? And, and that's what I was just going to say is that, you know, in my experience with hypnotherapy and my experience with meditation, I mean, you definitely have to usually do meditation longer and, you know, consistently do it to be able to train yourself how to get into that state, right? Versus yes. with hypnotherapy, someone else guiding you, like for me, at least it's like, I don't want to yes. say immediate, but it's really fast, right? Absolutely. And so, I mean, even my own personal experience, if I look back to six years ago, I, I was self-diagnosed busy woman syndrome mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I didn't know how to sit still. I didn't know how to slow down. It mm -hmm. felt uncomfortable for me. And mm -hmm. I think that's a very common thing. Mm -hmm. Our nervous systems, we get used to being yep. constantly on alert. Yep. We don't know how to actually calm down, how to relax, yes. how to sit with ourselves. Yeah. And the idea of yoga meditation, that just sounded not fun for me. What <laughs> Boring. Is that even mean? Yeah. <laughs> That's what a lot of women are like, yeah. mm, I don't want to do that in my free time. 
Yeah. yeah. And then I did hypnotherapy mm-hmm. and I, for the first time in my life, I tapped into that space between mm. thoughts and everything kind of slowed down. And it was such a uh, relief to experience. It was very rewarding once yeah. you actually feel it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's when the process starts. I started seeking out more meditation because of hypnotherapy. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like the gateway drug to meditation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that's, what's really cool about the, about, about doing hypnotherapy is that once you practice it enough, you can, you can do it on your own. Yeah. There's a yeah. lot of self-hypnosis techniques. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And going back to what you were saying about, you know, that voice. So I think a lot of us maybe don't even understand that there's a voice that's happening all the time that's saying, do this, don't do this. Yeah. You know? And it's a protective mechanism, right? It's yeah. we've evolved to have that voice to protect us from danger, but it really does keep us locked in, you know? And so I yeah. always encourage my clients if they haven't really noticed that that voice even exists, because I think a lot of people don't even realize that. So to understand that first, and then that's just one voice, right? Yeah. And that sometimes it needs to, I think Elizabeth Gilbert said this, you know, basically like it needs to go to the back seat of the car. It can, it can be there, yes. but she's the driver, you know, and it yes. doesn't have to be in control all the time. And so I, I love that idea of getting to that state where it's just, it's calmed down a little bit. And, and I don't know if you're an extrovert, but I think a lot of times the busy woman is an extrovert too. And so that is so foreign to get into that sort of calm place yeah. Until you finally do. <laughs> yeah. And it really has to do exactly what you said, Christine, with how you relate to that voice. Mm-hmm. For me, it was kind of this mind blowing concept. The first time I realized just because I have a thought doesn't mean it's true mm-hmm. or that I have to go along with it, that I have to believe it. Mm-hmm. I can actually choose to say, okay, that's that's my inner cave woman. I call her, mm. right? Yeah. I think and it's so good to name. Them, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. She's trying to protect me mm-hmm. and thank, I thank her for that, yes. but, but I'm the one in charge. Yeah. Um, I like to think of it also another way of thinking of that voice. It's kind of like the hostess at a restaurant. Let's say like you own a restaurant, you've got mm-hmm. this hostess. It's doing amazing. It's overflowing with people. Mm-hmm. The hostess is there to seat people and decide like who gets to come in. You can't mm-hmm. be overflowed. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And let's say you haven't been to the restaurant for a while. You come to your own restaurant. The hostess doesn't recognize you. And she says, sorry, there's a line out the door. We can't let you in. You're not going to yell at the hostess. You're not going to get mad at her. You're not going to say, oh, I'll, I'll just go home. You're going to say, well, thank you so much for doing such a great job. That's why this place is successful, Mm, but mm -hmm. I own this place. (laughs) (laughs) FYI, in case you forgot. I'm coming in, (laughs) right? And that's kind of how you have to think about relating to that voice. And it's important when we talk about stress, because I know I was watching your webinar with Mm -hmm. the five ways to, the five ways to make your menstrual cycle flow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. In 2023, Mm -hmm. which was an amazing webinar. I loved it. I watched the replay. Um, And you were talking about the brain being triggered by stress, telling the adrenals to release cortisol. Mm -hmm. This is where that like top down processing comes in. Mm -hmm. There's in the morning when we wake up, we go through that state of hypnosis and we don't have a critical mind to filter what we want to take in. Mm. And so if you wake up first thing in the morning and you Mm -hmm. check your email, you turn on the news, you look at social media, you're taking in all of that information Mm. without a critical filter. Interesting. And that's a time in of day when, or that's, that's a time when you want that critical filter because you want the filter to say, no, you know what? I don't accept this as part of my reality. Just because I'm watching something really violent on, on the news Mm. doesn't mean it's part of my day. Mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm. And so it's really important. Um, one of the first tips that I share is that 30 minutes after you wake up and 30 minutes before you go to sleep are sacred times to really Mm. practice carving out, even if it's just five minutes or 10 minutes of calm, Yes, that practice over time will set your day and it will change the way you relate to stressful experience throughout your entire day and your entire life. Absolutely. Yeah. Your stress response essentially is a habit. It's a chemical habit. The Mm -hmm. more we've practiced stress, the more we're triggered, the more we become trigger happy. And a lot of us are operating in a state of chronic fight or flight. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. 
And, and so we have to go ahead. I was just to say, you have to practice calm. You have to, yes. it's like a muscle. You got to go to the calm gym every single day in order to exercise that part of the brain. Sorry, Absolutely. Ahead. And that's what I think is so key is that it is an exercise. It is a, you know, you're, you won't build muscle without consistently going to the gym. And the same thing is with, you won't create calm without consistently doing this. And, you know, what you said about that time, 30 minutes before bed, 30 minutes when you first get up in the morning, I mean, so much of hormone health goes back to our circadian rhythm, right? Mm -hmm. And what women begin to struggle with, one of the first things that I see, particularly mid to late 30s, is the sleep issue, right? Yes. And we are unfortunately on our phones, you know, at bedtime or watching something on our computer. And that is stimulating that stress hormone cortisol to stay high and suppressing melatonin, our sleep hormone, right? And so yeah. it's, there's so many layers to it of not giving yourself that space particularly before bedtime, right? Absolutely. Yeah, transition. Yeah. Well, and I, one thing that I work a lot with clients when it comes to sleep is mm -hmm. it's, it's that we've simply gotten bad at turning off fight or flight, yes. turning off the, that, that system and moving into rest and digest. Yep. And so yep. even though you might practice meditation in the morning, that's impacting your ability to sleep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter when you practice it, mm -hmm. it's you're practicing the transition that yeah. I think a lot of people think I, in order to be resilient, I need to just never feel stress. And that's right. not true. Like, no, stress exactly. <laughs> we need it. I mean, we we, do. it's part of being human. Right. And it, it right. motivates us. We get things done et cetera. Right. Yeah. to take action. Yeah. Right. And so resilience is really just learning how to hit the off switch quicker. So mm -hmm. when there is a stress trigger, mm -hmm. how quickly can I say, can I take a deep breath and transition back into parasympathetic? Mm -hmm. And that's what hypnosis does. It so. activates parasympathetic. So it teaches you how to get out of that fight or flight quicker. Yeah. And so then you become really good at falling asleep and also just becoming aware of the thoughts. A lot of with sleep, a lot of us get stuck in the thinking stage. Yeah. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so the goal is to notice that you're in the thinking stage and be like, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm thinking yep. there. None of this thinking is going to help me right now. Yeah. So let's Just move into, <laughs> yeah. And something that actually happens that we don't realize when it comes to sleep is consciously or subconsciously, the thoughts start to turn to thinking about a relaxing experience. Mm -hmm. And that's what walks us into the deeper sleep. Mm -hmm. And so I teach moving your thoughts into what is your favorite relaxing place? Mm -hmm. How does it feel to be at the spa or be on the beach? Mm -hmm. Start, take that critical mind and redirect her mm -hmm. right. and start, okay, I'm going to think about something that feels really calming and relaxing to me. And that'll actually occupy that mind and help you transition into sleep. Right. And I love this idea of sort of building the muscle of going back and forth between our sympathetic or fight or flight response and the parasympathetic or rest and repair. It reminds me a little bit of um, the idea of metabolic flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. So this idea that we can burn, you know, uh, fat when we need to burn carbs when we need to, and be able to go back and forth between those well, right? And yeah. so the idea here is not to, neither is good or bad, right? We need both. Right. And to train your body how to do that, to easily go between those two states is to me, that's what balance is really, right? Because we're never yeah. going to be truly balanced. Yeah. But if we're able to go in between these states, you know, un under uh, being an expert, learning to be an expert at doing that, then that's really what's going to get you to the places that you want to go. Yeah. And the more you practice that state of calm, I mean, they've done research at UCLA on mindfulness meditation where they've done brain scans and they see that the amygdala, mm -hmm. that's that fight mm -hmm. or flight center of the brain actually yeah. shrinks. Like yeah. it actually gets oh, smaller. Wow. Oh, it gets, that's cool. It's fascinating. Yeah. The more you practice mindfulness, noticing you're in that state of fight or flight, mm -hmm. transitioning out of it. And so what happens is it, then we become less reactive to the other things that, yep. you know, yep. I remember 
<laughs> this is kind of a funny story about my mom and love her to death. She'll probably listen to this and laugh. But I remember <laughs> being a, coming home from the bus stop. She picked us up at the bus stop in, at, in school. We come in and she had left the oven on oh. and there was like, smoke and the, the turkey Ugh. had been burned and it was oh, like no. oh my gosh the turkey <laughs> like ah, right and it's like it's okay like yeah. the turkey is not a code red yeah right it's nobody's gonna die so we have to remember we, it's important that we triage our stress we have to become aware of when we're going code red for things that are actually code yellow or code mm-hmm, green mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and a lot of us treat greens like they're reds all the time. Right. All the time. Yeah. And it's partly being stuck in that kind of what we talked about earlier. It's, I don't want to say it's an addiction, but yeah. it's just being stuck in that sort of high right. stress, high cortisol state. Yeah. It is not. And I love that you said, it's not that uh, I agree. It's not an addiction, but it is homeostasis, right? Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. your brain's been functioning at a certain level, your body, your nervous system's been functioning there for so long that even if it's, it's, beneficial for you to move out of it, your body and your brain is going to be like, this doesn't feel right. Exactly. Uh, exactly. I mean, I was just reading something earlier about, um, you know, with alcoholism, it, the reason that you have to step down and do it, you know, in a space that is support is because your, your body has gotten into this homeostasis of needing that alcohol to function. Right. So if yes. you quit cold Turkey, then yes. bad things didn't happen. Right. And so it is this step down approach. And it's crazy that we think, well, our body's always trying to get us to the best place. And I believe that, but it's, it is responding to how you've been living and the way that you've been moving through the world, you know, which isn't all your fault because the world throws a lot at us, but this is where you're coming in and you're helping to kind of dial it down. Yeah. And it's really important that there's a belief system there. It's the all or nothing thinking, the perfectionism, right? How, raise your hand if you've been in the, <laughs> stuck in that belief system. Literally every woman I know. <laughs> yeah. And this is, yeah. I see so many women and so many clients and students of mine that they, they think they failed because they are yeah. not perfect in their yeah. And that's the problem is that they get a case of the efforts. Yep. Can I say that yep. on here? hundred percent. Right? Yep. And then they throw their hands in the air and they say, F it, I'm not going to start again until next week, next month or January yep. 1. Yep, exactly. And that's the, that's the shift. And what instead we need to do is focus on how can we gradually every single day, make a small shift, focus mm. on the schedule. Like I'll give you, I just used this example. I laughed with a friend of mine who is, trying to quit something cold turkey. And I said, remember that time that I tried to cut out sugar, quit alcohol and stop drinking coffee all at once. All the same time. Ask my my spouse how that was for (laughs) for all of us, right? It wasn't good for him either. Yeah, no. You know, and it's not sustainable. Anything that you can't do for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yep. isn't sustainable. So yep. for example, I'll tell you what I'm doing right now. I love January for resetting. Um, mm-hmm. I do have wine much more balanced now that I'm doing mm-hmm. the work that I do, mm-hmm. but I'm not having alcohol for the next month or two. Mm-hmm. But the other thing with coffee that I've done is I'm not cutting out coffee, but I'm making one small shift. Mm-hmm. And it's something that I was reinforced on when I watched your replay of your webinar. Uh-huh. I am, I have chosen to not have coffee on an empty stomach. There you go. Yep. And that's that's my one shift. Yes. Yes. And, and it tell you, it takes a lifestyle. So I have to wake up and make my smoothie before I make my coffee. And it's (laughs) it's been a thing, Yeah, but I could do that. I can, I can keep that up for the rest of my life. Right. Right. And I think that that is so important too, right. Is that we our society is sort of based on this in 30 days, you know, you're going to have gotten this because you've done this really hard thing for 30 days. And the reality Mm -hmm. is a lot of people can maybe the first time do that, you know, 30 day, we take out all these foods, even though they're miserable, you know, or maybe they feel better, but then as soon as it's over, these things come back in. And so they get in this mindset of like, oh, it worked before I'm going to do it again, but then it's harder the second time. And it's like, well, did it really work the first time? Right. It just, it was your first time doing it. And so you kind of, you will power your way through it, but this isn't going to be for the rest of your life. And so it is 
what are the small steps that you can take? Yeah. And I, and I believe so much in therapy and things like, um, hypnotherapy in order to help that process. Right. Because yeah. a lot of stress can come up even just about making these changes. Yeah. As I'm sure you went through when you tried to quit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alcohol, <Absolutely>. coffee, <laughs> sugar all at once. Right. <laughs> well, and it's, we, it's important that you look at what is this offering me? Like, for example, with somebody who comes new to quit smoking, mm -hmm. a lot of times what we see is, well, that's the only time they take a deep breath and a break. Mm -hmm. And so that's a <laughs> the irony okay, of the deep breath. <laughs> they need a deep breath and a break. Yeah. So if we're going to take away a coping mechanism, we need to put something else in place. Right, right, right. right? Yeah. yeah. And do so gradually because the homeostasis factor, the addiction mm -hmm. factor, right? Um, but, and I, what, I, what I will say to like the 30 day challenges or the 21 days of X, Y, Z, the behavior therapist in me wants to say, if that motivates you mm -hmm. great, mm -hmm. but the key is what happens after mm -hmm. what happens when you're finished that. And then how can you focus on the schedule? And then it, we come back to this idea of the case of the efforts, mm -hmm. right? Yep. <laughs> of always. who are It'll you in that moment? Yeah. yeah. Who are you in that moment? What we want to the goal is to get to a place of, okay, so I had two slices of cake at this birthday party. Now I'm going to, I'll go for a walk to help yep. it, my, my body process out that sugar yep. tomorrow morning. I'll have a protein smoothie. I'll do a couple of other things, to balance it out. I'll start again tomorrow. I'll start again with the next meal. That is the key. So it's Absolutely. not about Absolutely. Yes. Yes. I'm so really glad we're talking about starting this. Starting again. Yes. Yeah. And this is something that because of our, you know, salesy kind of approach that the way things are, unfortunately, these days, I mean, I guess sales have been around for a long time, but in terms of like the social media stuff coming at you, it's like, you know, yeah. eat this perfect way, do this, per you know, and then everything will all be fine. And the reality of any, every, almost every person, maybe a tiny little percentage can make huge changes and do that for the rest of their lives. I doubt that there are any, but the reality is we are going to have holidays. We are going to have things happen where we, you know, if you want to call it fall off the wagon or whatever, I, I don't even like to think about it that way because it is just life. And yeah. the point isn't to beat yourself up about that, right? Yes. It's that, like you said, like I, sugar for me is a good example where I used to sort of, once I went down that path, then it was a yes. month long situation. Right. Right. And, and who's coming into play there? Your inner critic, the cave yes. woman. Yes. Right. And yep. that's where the internal self-talk comes in. Mm -hmm. And that's where the belief systems come in, where it's like there's a belief there of like who you've been with sugar before mm -hmm. and what that means about who you are. Mm -hmm. And your that internal self-talk, mm -hmm. that identity is like, well, I've done, you know, I know how this goes. Like yep. I'm just gonna go down yep. this path. And so that's where when you change the belief system mm -hmm. around all or nothing around perfectionism, mm -hmm. around how you're talking to yourself, you shift who you are in that moment. And, yeah. and you're exactly right. I think, I think that the key to health is getting really good at starting again, yeah. because it's just like, you want to think about, and this comes back to homeostasis when it comes to success, it's never a straight line up, like a good I stock, <laughs> right? I know. Yeah. A, a good stock goes up and then down a little bit and then up and then down a little bit and up yeah. and then back a little bit. So it's a gradual progression. Mm -hmm. And so I like to think of it as like, you might come out the gate, like zooming up, but if you have some sugar, you have a few steps back. Okay. That's homeostasis. Yes. Kind yes. of mm -hmm. saying, whoa, mm -hmm. we're not used to this. And we got to integrate this level a yeah. little bit, Absolutely. but you're always moving up. Mm -hmm. And I think about my own health journey with food. Like now, if I don't have gluten or dairy for weeks, I won't, sometimes I won't even notice. I mean, I do have some gluten, like if I eat out, whatever, mm -hmm. but like during the week, I don't cook with it that much. Mm -hmm. And I don't even notice, but six, seven years ago, Mm -hmm. it was a huge deal mm -hmm. for me to not have gluten. Mm -hmm. And it took, it was a process yeah. Yeah. of integrating things a little bit at a time yeah. and of dabbling and in, in, in it and then coming back to it for a little bit and then realizing how amazing I feel without it. And then I started to rewire that, that association. Like it's really rewarding to eat these healthy foods. Like yeah. I, 
and this is what I teach in my course. It's, it's rewiring using that, um, subconsciously, we're all essentially trying to move towards what feels good and move Mm -hmm. away from what feels bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning change can feel bad because it's unknown. Yeah. Yep. Um, but if we consciously choose to say, Hey, this type of food doesn't feel good in my body. I want to recognize that then it's not because we're not punishing ourselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're not shaming ourselves. We're just taking data. And we're saying, huh, interesting. That doesn't feel good. That's not that rewarding. Yep. Uh, So that, yeah, go ahead. And then you look at a piece of cake and you're like, not running away from it, not running towards it, but you're kind of like, I don't really know if I want that because it doesn't feel that good in my body. Yes. And this is just, I'm so glad we're talking about this because this is the stuff I feel like that isn't talked about enough. The reality of changes, the reality of get, especially if you've had any, you know, eating disorder in your past or disorder of eating that way, that it can be hard to get out of the mentality of like, I'm doing this to lose weight or I'm doing this, you know, for body image issues versus like, I'm choosing not to eat that because it doesn't make me feel good, you know? Yes. And considering majority of women on some level have had some disordered eating in their past, yeah. you know, I, I, like I can relate to that being the motivation for me years ago, which is never going to stick and it's not yes. good for you, you know, versus getting to the place of like, oh, I'm tuned into my body and I've yeah. learned in this process that that just doesn't make me feel good, you know? And yeah, I'm not going to be a hundred percent and never choose it necessarily, but more and more each time. And it just becomes easier with time to sugar is a good example for me is I don't have those intense sugar cravings in the way yes. that I used to, you know, it, because of that process. It, all comes back to your relationship to self and Mm -hmm. self love. Mm -hmm. And so when you start to reconnect with yourself and this is Christine, this is kind of like the trauma work that you talk about. That's so important Mm -hmm. with hormone balance, Mm -hmm. because when you start to come back and reconnect with yourself and realize all the ways you've been taught to disconnect from yourself, Mm -hmm. maybe it was a trauma response. Maybe it was preserving, right? Mm Self-preservation. It was a coping mechanism at a time in your life. But where am I not loving or being kind to myself with my, with what I'm putting in my body, with how I'm treating my body, how I'm talking to myself. And when you can learn to really talk to yourself the way you would talk to a child or a friend, then you start to realize every single choice about food and movement can simply come from a place of love, Mm -hmm. self-love. How can I love myself with food today? How can I love myself with movement? And that means you get to decide. There might be a time when sugar or whatever it is, is a form of self-love and not because you're using it as an emotional coping mechanism, but because in that moment you're choosing to have some of it just because out of joy, out of life, celebration, celebration. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so you're exactly right. All comes back to your relationship to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where this work is so healing because like you said, so many of us, we, a lot of us without even realizing it probably have experienced some form of disordered eating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sadly, it's, I mean, it's hard to get through our culture and grow up in it without that happening, you know? Or even looking at our bodies and seeing our bodies as body dysmorphia, talking to ourselves. I I mean, right. I I know that I've experienced that in the past Um, Mm -hmm. as, as an athlete, Mm-hmm. I felt very disconnected from my body. I, I thought it made me tough to push past the pain. Right, right. So I didn't feel pain in my body for a long time. Because right. you like, were taught that, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so it it's such a healing process and an unwinding, I think, that so many of us have to go through. And, and yes, definitely working with the trauma that can be underlying that we don't even realize that is like kicking everything up you know, yeah. and keeping us in this sort of high cortisol state, which as we know, you know, will impact our sex hormones. That's where we yeah. got, that's where we got to go in first. Yeah. So, so can you actually explain the process of hypnotherapy for those that have never experienced it? How yeah. you work through it? Yeah. So, um, in a one-on-one setting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in a one-on-one setting, usually what we'll do is we'll have 
at least about 30 minutes of conversation because what I'm doing is I'm listening to your language. Mm -hmm. What are the words you're using? How are you, what are the triggers for Mm -hmm. you depending on whatever topic it is Mm -hmm. and how are you talking about it? Because we're essentially working with suggestibility. We're trying to create change in your belief system. Mm -hmm. So, and you are most suggestible to yourself. Right. So we listen for what has worked for you and what language and what imagery. So, and then we actually get to the hypnosis part is only 20, 25 minutes, but we walk you into that state, that jacuzzi for the brain where the, I love it, the jacuzzi for the brain. (laughs) And then we use imagery to create a new outcome. And now here's where I want to take it back to like what you talk about with like the brain signaling to the adrenals to release Mm -hmm. cortisol. Mm -hmm. So imagery is incredibly powerful. The brain doesn't really know the difference between a memory or a a thought or a visualization and an experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now a physical experience is going to be more intense because you're actually in it. So but a memory or a thought of a past experience actually changes the body. That's the mm-hmm. mind body connection. Mm-hmm. And what you, what, when you talk about the brain telling the adrenals to release cortisol, if you have a stressful thought, you think about something that happened in the past mm-hmm. that was stressful or traumatic, that signals to the body to release stress hormones, yep. Yep. just that thought. Mm-hmm. So what is that doing for your body? Now, what we do in hypnosis is we We quiet the critical mind because the critical mind might say, no, 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 no. I know where I've been. I know who I am. And I know this one trigger causes me stress. Right, right. But if we can quiet down that voice Mm -hmm. and then create a state of calm, Mm -hmm. A, you're you're cultivating positive emotions, positive hormones in the body. Yep, absolutely. Mm Mm-hmm. You're teaching the nervous system, the body, how to experience that. You're going to that calm gym, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's really healthy for you in that moment, but then you're also making it easier to access later on. Mm -hmm. And then we create imagery around a different outcome. Mm -hmm. And so with stress, for example, if there's a certain trigger, you can actually, first, we just tap you into a calming, safe place. What does that feel like? If you're not used to calming and getting still, what does that even feel like? Let's just start there. Right. And then we start getting you, you start, we create an anchor so you can access that state. And then with repetition, you listen to that. I record the hypnosis and Mm -hmm. you listen to your audio recording regularly. You tap into that space regularly. You're going to the calm gym regularly. And then the next session you come in and we bring up the trigger with, depending on what it is. I mean, Mm -hmm. if it's, if it's an intense trauma, we don't go back to trauma necessarily. There's different ways to work with trauma, but if it's like every time um, I don't know, get, okay. For example, getting on the 405, I live in California. It's a, it's a very scary highway (laughs) causes me anxiety. Right. Right, So we bring that up visualizations. We get you into a calm state and we bring up a visualization Mm. of that trigger while you're in the calm state. And we move you back and forth between feeling Mm. the arousal and feeling calm. Okay. And so you start to realize that your brain is controlling all of this. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's like a desensitization process. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, there's, there's a lot of different angles. I mean, and the other thing I want to throw out here is that we didn't really talk about a lot of these belief systems get solidified when we're little, because prior to the age of eight, we don't have a critical filter. Right. Right. So we establish these mm-hmm. identities, who we are, where we've been, what, you know, how do we relate to sugar? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. at a very young age, a lot of us are taught to that sugar is a reward. Sugar yep. is the friend that's always there for you. Yep. It's, it's a calming comfort. thing. It's yeah. all of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a pacifier. It's yep. a, oh, don't yep. cry, honey. Yep. Have a cupcake. You're so Here's brave. a cookie. Even you yeah. go to the dentist and you did good yes. and you get like a lollipop. <laughs> And you're like, we're here for the purpose of (laughs) not having that much sugar. Yeah. So we start, so we learn all that stuff at a young age, and then that becomes our belief system and our filter by which we view the world and our Mm -hmm. filter of our behavior. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's interesting. I didn't even realize that it's eight, age eight, when you start to get that critical uh, mind and then your, the frontal lobe doesn't even right Come around until like the your like, mid 20s right yeah. or something like that so yeah. it's 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 a it's amazing it makes sense why so many of us are walking around wounded you know what i'm saying yeah. because yeah. of all of there's those a child things. within yeah. us yeah 
And you, if you take it back, what I, um, I do a lot of inner child work mm -hmm. as part of my course. That's what I teach. Mm -hmm. Inner child work is integral to shifting your relationship to food and, and self and mm -hmm. exercise and all these things because it, mm -hmm. it's working with the self. Yes. Essentially there's a child within all of us. It's the child that's triggered. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's the child that didn't get what they needed emotionally in that moment. And I love that you called it trauma with a big T, but then there's, we all experience trauma, mm -hmm. right? All of us, if you're human, you've had, you've had some form of trauma and it might not have been life threatening, but right. when you were six years old, it could have felt like that. Absolutely. And so emotionally you didn't get a need met at a certain time that can imprint. And so with inner child work, we go back and we fill that we, we, we reparent, we, when we do this in hypnosis mm -hmm. with the critical mind relax, we go back, we, we talk to that inner girl mm -hmm. and we play with her and we tell her how much we love her yeah. and how proud of her we are and any other words that she needs to hear. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just like calling and listening to it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, Oh, you know, I, I mean, I think that that is something that so many of us miss out on is that, that inner child work, you know, and how important yeah. it really is to right. even our hormones now, you know, yeah. again, these things that got sort of stuck in your system at that age actually literally impact your hormones now and can be, I've seen clients that have done all the quote unquote right things, eat the right foods, take the right supplements, you know, do the yoga, all of that. And things aren't getting better. And it's because yeah. of that trauma that's still yeah. happening in there, you know? Well, and the voice, usually the critical voice is the voice of someone else. We've mm -hmm. picked up certain phrases, things that, and it doesn't mean that someone necessarily said it to us. We could have watched the way that mom talked to herself about food, right. grandma, or body. She about her body. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. We internalize that mm -hmm. or it could be a coach or a dance teacher, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Some, somebody said something to us as, as a child or as a young human, mm -hmm. and we internalize it and we repeated it. And that self-talk is it, at its most basic level. Self-talk is also a habit. Mm -hmm. How you're talking to yourself is a habit. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. one way of really shifting that internal self-talk is through in, inner child work. And it's imagery that mm -hmm. changes the brain that mm -hmm. affects the body. Yeah. Um, so, and we do that in hypnosis and then it becomes a practice of tapping in your inner girl. What does my inner girl need today? Mm -hmm. How I loved this around the holidays. I really use this with my students in happy body blueprint, asking mm -hmm. yourself this week around holidays, asking yourself every single morning, what does my inner girl need today? Because if I can fill up my own cup emotionally, I am way more available for my family. hundred percent. Yeah. Does she absolutely. need a little time to herself? Yeah. Does she need a 20 minute walk? Does she need some play to dance and enjoy, like dance around with your kids and enjoy the holidays, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What does she need? And can you carve something out just a little bit of time for her every day during the holidays to check in? Mm -hmm. Because that's emotional housekeeping you're doing internally. Mm -hmm. That's going to help you when it comes time to making choices about food, stress, lowering stress in the body, choosing foods that are nourishing to you, right. choosing to take time for movement. Yeah. Yep. You got to fill yourself up. This is what, you know, I, I know we hear this message a lot these days, but I feel like it needs to be said again and again, because it is once you fill yourself up that you be, can not only be there for everyone else, you know, uh, yeah. I, I mean, with boundaries, of course, you know, yes. we yeah. can't constantly give, but so many of, you know, w women that I know, have gotten into that particularly around the holidays falling into eating these different foods because they're just stressed out and they don't even yeah. think about it right it's yeah they, it's there it's, the it's everywhere and so yeah. it's like well, just here it is you know and and it, I, I mean I get it it's not easy we live in times where it's just all of these processed foods are so easily available all the time especially with the holidays but of course if you're internally stressed that you're just going to kind of fall into that old yeah uh pattern Right. And if you're looking you for an outlet from yes, it, yes, that wine is what you've used as the outlet. It's the yes. vacation from whatever is happening in your present yes. moment. But if you're practicing every day, getting in touch with what do I need? Oh, I need a little, a moment of calm. Yeah. Yeah. You can find that in other ways. And then you can make the choice about the glass of wine or about the yep. 
from yep. a place of groundedness, yes. calm nervous system, conscious choice. Yes, absolutely. And I think this is so important too for this, you know, thing that sort of happened in the past 10 years or so where especially towards mothers, right? The whole like wine o'clock and, and, you know, I need my glass of wine or two at the end of the day to unwind and, and how that became such a part of our culture and normalized. And, you know, I see now so many women saying, wait, is this really good for me? You know, is this, yeah. is this working to support me in myself to support me as a parent? Maybe yeah. not, you know, and again, it's because it can be so easy to fall into that trap of just doing that right. unconsciously, you know, versus yeah. what do I really need in order to truly fill my own? Yes. I hate, to, I, I try not to say this word because I can't really say it well, but co coffers, right? Yeah. In, in order to, I was like, do I say it? Anyway, it is a funny order, word. <laughs> it is, I'm like, it's coffers or something. I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> to fill our cup up. And then you can make the decisions from that place. It doesn't mean that you're never going to drink wine again. Yeah. It just means that you're making it from, like you said, this like conscious place. Right. And when we're holistically nourished emotionally and physically, then food and wine, all those things become secondary. Mm -hmm. They become mm -hmm. choices that you make mm -hmm. as opposed to coping mechanisms. Yes. And it's really important like that we don't it's this fine line between not shaming ourselves right. for having something. Right. It's about noticing that we're turning to someone, getting really honest of like, yeah. okay, I'm actually using that as a treatment and not a treat. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a really good way of putting it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you are noticing it without shame, it's just data. Okay. Yep. And becoming more conscious. What is it that I'm missing? What am I really hungry for? Right. Right. And I, you know, thinking of meditation, I'm sure the same is true for hypnotherapy is it helps you to sort of look at it from an outside perspective a little bit more rather than being so in it and getting into yes. the shame spiral. Right. Because yeah. you start to recognize these sort of different aspects of yourself and that yes. you don't have to be yeah. in the, you know, sort of triggered place. This is all about yeah. me being bad kind of a thing. And so it supports that too. And that's because the critical mind is mm -hmm. relaxed. Calmed. The yeah. critical mind is not as active. Yeah. It's yeah. that critical voice is the one that tells you, how dare you? Right. What were you thinking? Right. 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 Uh, and so when we yeah. get into, when we start practicing meditation, hypnosis regularly, we, we start to that we just uh, relate to that voice differently. We can slow that voice down a little bit. We can ask, is it true? Is it helpful? Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. this thought helping me right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And absolutely. choosing not to entertain the ones that aren't helping us move forward. Yeah. Oh, right? I love it. Because, yeah. It just makes me feel like really thinking back again and again to that inner child and how much love she needs. Right. And that, yes. that so many women don't have time to focus on because they're all the things. I know. Yeah. I, you know, I laugh because I have a lot of clients that come to me and they say, I I'll joke. This is one client who's she's said, it's fine if I share her story. So I'll share it. Um, when she came to me about health and wellness, she mm -hmm. was like, I have this thing with scones. Like I can't stop eating scones <laughs> and there's so many of them and I I'm eating too many and I don't understand. And we had our last session together uh, recently. And she said, I realize now this has nothing to do with the scone. Mm, yeah. And you're like, that's a great realization yep. that you made, right? Yep. Right. That yep. it, it's yep. everything else. Yeah. It's being completely detached from allowing yourself to feel certain things, processing emotions, yeah. taking care of yourself, talking kindly to yourself. And after even just one session of realizing our relationship to sugar subconsciously, that shifted. That was enough for her. She came into session too. Like I bought a scone and then I didn't eat it. It was the weirdest thing. And then <laughs> it just, I just didn't want it. I, I, I don't know what happened. Right. Yeah. And you're but like, look, it works. <laughs> right. Because it's yeah. a very simple shift. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. then when we start meeting our emotional needs internally, food doesn't become the, the answer mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and, and, yeah. and it's so interesting because I can think of one of my clients, you know, who, Certainly there's a lot of trauma in her background, but really, you know, when she gets into a state 
around just things coming up for her, she will always focus on her weight as the issue, you know, and I'm mm-hmm. always trying to yeah. let her know it's, it's all of these other things, you know, and she, she right. gets that, but is still sort of working on that. Yeah. yeah. You know, cause we can just so easily fall back into right. that. If I can just get my weight under control, right. Then everything will be perfect, you know? Right. Yeah. And it's so interesting how like, there's so much emphasis put on weight. Like with you go to the doctor's office and they weigh you right away. And it's like, well, and I haven't stepped on a scale in two years. And that's something that I encourage because what happens, this is, we're coming, it's coming back to motivation. We, Mm -hmm. we want to engage in the daily things, the schedule that Mm -hmm. keeps us nourished and healthy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you could be doing all the right things. And then you step on a scale and you see then a number that you, your critical mind believes attaches to. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't Mm -hmm. right. Isn't Mm -hmm. good. Right. Mm -hmm. And immediately you feel less motivated. You stop doing all of the things that mm-hmm. were healthy. Mm-hmm. You start shaming yourself, mm-hmm. right? All the things that, that keep you stuck. Yeah. And so that's, that's part of the reason, like, I don't look at a scale because, and right. I realize that it is very deeply ingrained and some people might still, that might motivate them. And if that right. motive, you know, if it motivates you, okay, fine. But I would pay close attention to how much that's impacting your daily behaviors. Absolutely. Because you know, the thing is that I see with most of my clients when they do have that scale, I don't want to call it an addiction, but it's hard for them to get rid of the scale is that, like you just said, either it will make you feel horrible because you don't like the number or it'll make you feel really good because you like that number today. But then two weeks down the road, if you get a number that is higher than that last time, then you feel even worse, right? So it just, it's this constant like resetting in the negative aspects of it. So, you know, and it's, I mean, it really gives gives us such little information that we need to know. Yeah. And motive, right. Exactly. And motivation really comes down to like feeling good in your body. Yes. And that's where we come back to like connecting to the body. The goal is to feel good every single day. Yeah. So like, ultimately we all think we want to lose weight. We all think we want to fit into our skinny jeans or Mm -hmm. whatever Mm -hmm. it is. Right. But really what we want is the joy and the lightness and the good Mm -hmm. feeling that comes along with that definition, that, that, that imagery that we've attached to it. So if we can practice today, feeling good in our bodies, we've already reached our outcome. Yeah. And then what happens is when you're practicing every day or you're in hypnosis, practicing, feeling good, feeling lighter, Mm -hmm. the imagery of your outcome, right? Mm -hmm. When you're practicing those emotions, you're training the body and the nervous system to move out of the homeostasis it's been in Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to get to the next level. Mm -hmm. So that's where it comes back to imagery and emotion. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And anything that makes you feel like crap about the good behaviors is not helping you. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so get rid of it. Yeah. This is just, about feeling good. Sorry. You're allowed to feel good right now. That's another thing I see a lot. I, I try to remind my clients 10% more yeah. good feelings in your day. Yes, absolutely. Because we don't want to be living this life just for someday feeling better, right? It's yeah. like, you can start now. It doesn't have to, it's not going to necessarily be the whole shebang all at once, but you start to build that. And that's what's sustainable over time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, this is such an amazing conversation that you brought together so many good points that I think people will really appreciate and understand. So thank you for yeah. doing that. So yeah. let people know how they can work with you. Yeah. So I actually, I have a free training at happybodyblueprint.com. Or you can find me on Instagram, Brooke Ansley Wellness, and drop me a message. Just follow me. Let me know you're here. Let me know you listen to this podcast. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we can go from there. If you're interested in one-on-one hypnotherapy, Instagram is great. It's easy to remember my handle, Perfect. I think, than, than my we'll, email. So We'll have the all of the links in the show notes, too, so people can yeah. go directly there, too. So, cool. well, well, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me been so good. Yeah. All right, you guys, I will see you next week.